Joining me uh, to have a conversation about free speech and sport is a political professor here at the University of Michigan, Dr. Christian Davenport. So as a political science expert, tell me if you think sport is an appropriate platform or venue for social and political activism. That's really loaded. Um, so what I find intriguing about the question is um, this element of there's a, there's a space that is acceptable for protest and there's a space that isn't. Protest isn't supposed to be convenient. It's not supposed to be appropriate. It's supposed to basically go where it needs to go. So from that perspective, I think um, if sport did not wish to be a potential venue, then it shouldn't be valued and it shouldn't have a large audience because by having that, it makes itself completely open and will be anything that has those two elements to it is a target for protest activity. Now, whether or not it's appropriate or not, that's, that, that's I actually don't take that stand because I'm just like, um, that then gets to issues of evaluation or appropriateness that in some sense transcends conceptions of the temporality, right? So um, I'm sure the British would be upset with what the Americans did with the American Revolution. I'm sure the South Africans were upset with what Mandela did. It's really an issue of kind of like um, whether or not you end up on the right side of history or not. So from that perspective, um, sport, like anything, the minute it gets the audience, the minute it gets the attention, the minute it gets the value, it's a target. And that makes it legitimate from the perspective of kind of like political science or sociology. That's where we would look to see them take place. And there's lots of debate, as you know. And you mentioned, is it appropriate? Is it not appropriate as, as a venue? But nonetheless, there seems to be a galvanizing energy that we're seeing relative to political and social activism in sport. Is what we're seeing, can we classify that as a social movement? Um, so to have a social movement, you kind of need um, uh, a couple of elements. Uh, there's a, there's a claims-making effort and that's where you're simultaneously offering a kind of diagnosis of a problem and prognosis, a solution. And so um, that element is kind of deficient in many respects because people are kind of clearer on the, what the problem is. So like, you know, Copernic, police brutality, I'm not hearing much of a solution. But then I'm not really expecting that person to come up with a solution. It's a broader community that's coming up with one. Um, there's normally some formalized organization that is affiliated with the movement. There is a certain designated set of tactics that are taken with it. Taking a knee could clearly be viewed as a tactic, raising one's fist, um, petitions, protests, demonstrations, all these things. So I think what we have in many respects is, um, it is, a, is a loose coordinated movement, but nevertheless I think it would fit within the general sense of there is a claim, there is a problem, there is a solution, there's, there's solutions that are being put forward, there are distinct organizations that are out there mm -hmm. that are more or less organized and coordinated, and there is some um, effort put forward that if it were to be addressed, there would be a, a fundamental shift in the political, economic, or kind of cultural world. And so from that perspective, I think it fits, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, you know, with that in mind, you talk about the claim and and the, all of the issues that have to be evident to have social movement, then we've had these kinds of issues in sport for a long time. So what has happened, like what has happened in this moment that has allowed us to see this expression to the extent that we are? I think, I think part of it is this issue of impropriety, right? So um, there's this moment or there's these spaces that come to kind of carry on this particular momentum. And having those spaces violated then kind of transports people in many respects. Uh, so prior to coming to University of Michigan, I was at Notre Dame, and I remembered um, the Rockets Red Glare part of the national anthem and the, like, the Air Force is going right over. Um, I'm not really one for being happy about militarization or anything like that, so I was sitting. And so, you know, someone made some comment about standing up, and I'm just like literally going, I'm like, no. And then conversation ended. But I think there's something about the buildup of this particular part of the sequence of events that takes place before many sporting events that invoke certain types of things. And if you challenge someone's core value in some way um, that they interpret in a particular way, then they're going to be upset. But that said, um, what's interesting is we've had walkouts in the NBA, the NHL, the NFL, and like, you know, people didn't have the same visceral response. They were upset that they didn't get what they wanted on Sunday. Mm -hmm. And so they want their delivery of like their service in a sense. Mm -hmm. And they don't want their politics blended with their recreation in many respects, but protest is supposed to be inconvenient in many respects, as I was suggesting before. And so this, I think, kind of like, it captured this moment where the NFL hasn't been ex explicitly politicized in stadium. 
Now, many of these people are quite active outside of the stadium, and it's interesting, right, because like someone's going to do something, like I remember um, Stefan Marbury goes back to his high school, and he's giving all types of resources to help them out, and he's developing a sneaker that is, in, that is inexpensive so that people aren't shooting one another. No one had problems with that. That clearly fell in line with he's addressing a social problem, he's coming up with a solution, he's doing this in a coordinated fashion. There was all the elements that were there. But Stefan wasn't making make, make any comments in Madison Square Garden, right? And so um, it was the, this is appropriate for you to do in this context and that domain alone, and you leave these other, other domains alone. But the idea that these individuals that we endow with all these values and power effectively, that they use the power where certain people deem it to be acceptable, no. It's like these people have the power. You either take it away from them or you allow them to kind of run with it. And so by using it in the context of this ritualized element, you know, you're walking into the stadium, you're grabbing your food, you're getting your seat. It's part of the pageantry that is this particular event. And then you've, disrupt, you've disrupted it. It's just like, although I remember seeing people just completely disignore, you know, not pay attention at all to the, to the national anthem. So I'm just like, why are people that are going to get a hot dog during the national anthem not treated in the same exact manner, not as politicized as this knee? So I think there's a, there's a pseudo sacred element to this particular ritual that got disrupted and everyone kind of like freaked. How could they be so disrespectful? And then, you know, literally people aren't unpacking it. It's like the song's problematic. Bow, you know, bowing to the state is problematic for a variety of different reasons. I mean, we may have said, if, like, if Native Americans didn't sit down, I mean, we, there's a whole bunch of things that just, if you gave it some more thought. But what the act did was basically just kind of transport individuals and, and force them to basically try to interpret or understand somebody else's perception on mm -hmm. the words and the ritual and so forth. And no one really likes to do that. Mm -hmm. And so from that perspective, I think it was very jarring. You know, very good comment. I mean, you, t you addressed a lot of issues, you know, the, the sequence and all the other things that are happening and the extent to which some elements of activism were perceived favorably yeah. and others were contested very hotly. Yeah. Let me ask you, again, from a political science perspective, when you talk about the sequence of events, was there any element or role in the political landscape that could have also mm -hmm. fueled what we're seeing now? I mean, clearly, clearly there's a a nationalistic revisitation is taking place in many respects in the states where um, if you think of how um, the Trump administration has kind of catalyzed and separated many parts of the country and then caused a revisitation to what it means to be an American itself. So I think all these rituals get ramped up. That said, um, there's certain things like the flag burning. We've had flag burning since the founding of the nation. And the variation in the response to flag burning has quite varied. But during the Reagan administration, it was like a really big issue in part because Reagan was incredibly very patriotic and very nationalistic and condescendingly so. It's like, well, why would you be upset? How could you burn the flag? How could you ever do that? And so I think everyone's kind of like hyped up now for a lot of symbols of national identity, um, community, and so forth. And so. Um, rather than engaging in debate and deliberation and understand alternative meanings, we have the simplistic understanding of what the rituals are. We have the simplistic understanding of what the Constitution means. All these things are being imposed upon different populations. So effectively, you either stand up or roll with the kind of like um, the parade or charade, however it's going along. Or if you, if you take any step off of that, then you're just going to be stigmatized and attacked. Um, but I think those are the moments at which articulation of exactly what the grievances are and how deeply they go, all that then kind of like is now a moment to have that conversation, which I welcome those moments. And so um, by having this kind of imposition of, okay, I'm going to tell you what to think coming from not just the administration, but many parts of the culture, many other parts of the culture are just like, no, you're not. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's democracy at its best, I think. When you talk about culture, one of the more pervasive elements of culture that has helped us to know what to think, how to think, when to think it, is the media. And I know you've done research on media bias. Tell me if you think the media has played a role in either advancing or challenging this movement that we're seeing relative to free speech and sport. What's difficult about um, um, that particular phenomena is so the media, which is supposed to be the manifestation, the fifth estate, right? The manifestation of free speech is owned. And so quite frequently they're owned by some of the same individuals that own the teams. And so if you look at the concentration in media over time, there's no way we'd expect to have um, a reasonable discussion, an open laying out of the different claims that they're being made, background conditions and so forth. And so um, um, the media is having an effect in the sense that they are truncating deliberation, they're truncating discussion, they're truncating background discussions. That said, 
Um, there's things like um, the New York Times has got this series now on race, which is like, um, it's not in the newspaper, which is funny, right? But um, you can sign up for it, and they send you the development of these race-related themes so you could follow up. And so I think there are some venues, there are some venues that exist within the media to kind of explore these issues in a little bit of more detail mm -hmm. or take advantage of new media like social media, right? Um, once you realize that African Americans are making up 30, 35 percent of like social media or Twitter or something like that, there's mm -hmm. there are these venues where kind of things are going to be created. Or alternatively, people go to zines or they'll think of something else. What I find interesting is like, Organizations like GQ are, ki are stepping in. I mean, like they basically they did a piece on Copernicus on the cover, and then effectively they 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 embrace his silence, mm -hmm. and they're allowing other people to speak on his behalf, including his partner, which is just like a, a, a wonderful kind of like resonant way of allowing him to kind of maintain his politically um, defined silence, because mm -hmm. um, silence has been as used as almost any other form of kind of expression and let other people that have something, Harry Belafonte and others to speak on his behalf about what that, what that silence, what this protest means. And so um, it signals for me that a moment of kind of having this vibrancy of div civil discourse, mm -hmm. um, of showing how in, in a certain sense revealing the media to be the biased entity that it is, which is something that is owned to communicate to a particular audience certain types of messages about certain types of things at certain points of time. And so no one's going to go deeply into it, but they're not set up to do that. They're set up to be fragmentary and short and kind of like um, not give much attention to things. So in a sense, we have to look past the media to actually get to deeper discussions of what these things are going on. If you remember the, um, when Clinton was in office, we had this kind of presidential dis discussion, um, that round table led by John Hope Franklin that went around the country to talk about race. Mm -hmm came to a community, there'd be a round table, they'd, or, or like a, the table that local people would talk and the people from the commission would talk, and then they'd open it up to like the, let the community speak. Those, those transcripts are phenomenal to read to get some sense of like what people are actually thinking. But if you looked at the media coverage of those events, you would think that just the, the round table rolled into town, you heard like three people, some snippets, they give you some background thing about where it came from the president, and then they left. And so I think um, in a sense, we, we can't look to the media for the full story. We shouldn't look to the media for the full story. We need to look at a bunch of other venues to get context, to get history, to get meaning. Um, yeah. Well, you know, most social movements have a life cycle, right? Yeah. Like they're, they're introduced, they grow, they, they, they become stabilized or they plateau. And then at some point there's a decline. Yeah, yeah. So we're seeing, as I see it, a growth in this movement relative to free speech and sport. Yeah. Do you think this growth will continue? Um, I think it, well, so this overlaps, right? And I, I think you were, you, were, you were correct in prompting me with regards to the broader political context. So I think, I think that the general restrictiveness and hyper-nationalism we see from the Trump administration is creating a bunch of spinoffs. Mm -hmm. The Me Too spinoff, um, this, sports and, um, this sports and activism spinoff, and it's not as if we don't have more than police violence to focus in on. There's so many other things. And so what I'm imagining is that the topics will expand. Because mm -hmm. um, the one interesting thing about the sport is like, so a large number of African-American males in this particular context are being extracted from these communities and expected to kind of forget those experiences, mm -hmm. take some money, go play some sports, and live the wonderful life. But many of these people have not done that. Many of these people are still interacting with their family. They're still maintaining con connections with community. And since the things, the conditions in the communities have not changed, to say whether or not they're going to take these platforms that they have, if anything, I would expect um, um, the diffusion across different sports to manifest okay. itself. Um, and then, um, I mean, we just dealt with um, uh, the Olympics in winter, right? But it's like um, summer sports, um, the 50th anniversary in 1968. Okay. We're seeing expansion, um, and so um, we're seeing expansion in some heat. I mean, so this, those two things, right. those two things together, yes. um, and and a lack of change, and a lack of seeing hope, mm -hmm. and so I think a lot of folks are going to now see these opportunities and inspirations from this particular movement as a catalyst to actually begin to start to talk about things. Um, now, how those conversations come together, mm -hmm. um, what I don't like is. Um, among the different elements I laid out about movements, the organizational capacity, the organizational existence, that's the thing that I think is weakest. So Black Lives Matter isn't structured as it, as it is. Mm -hmm. I, where's the NAACP? What other organizations do we have? Black churches have an opportunity to get back in. I mean, there's historical black colleges. There's a bunch of people that could 
speak that aren't necessarily speaking in a coordinated fashion. And so I think that's the thing that would be most, most inspiring to see. So you, you, you talk about, in some regard, if I hear you right, how sport is also influencing other social institutions in this yeah. regard. And we've seen this historically. You know, we know women's movement really got a, a huge uh, um, uh, expansion because of Billie Jean King and the yeah. Battle of the Sexes. And we know that what's been happening when Jackie Robinson integrated baseball, it made people rethink civil rights. Yeah. What is it about sport that has this power to inspire activism in the social political landscape in general? Mm. Um, so I literally, I almost want to go back to like um, the Roman period and talking about gladiators. There's, All there's, right, you there's, can. There's something we, there's something we have as a kind of like Western dominated or Western influenced society. There's something we have about um, championing these individuals in this physical contestation bouts and that we endow them with tremendous amounts of power. They, they, they speak to the American dream or the ability of an individual to transcend all these things, to reach mastery and to then basically kind of explore and explode in many respects. And so because we give so much attention to that um, and we're giving, we're, we're effectively, they're on a platform because of their prowess with regards to the, how they're playing the sports. But while they're on that platform, they have this opportunity to basically provide a bunch of information and shed light on a bunch of issues, topics, um, tactics, and so forth that serves as this diffusionary mechanism. So Lonnie Guinier speaks about this. Um, she's, like, she's like, look to the Supreme Court, but not the rulings. Look at the, um, what's the, uh, the kind of critical commentary that comes off of the side? Um, the dissenting opinion. Mm -hmm. The dissenting opinion signals, this is what we were thinking about as a court, and this is what you should do in terms of activism. But so we, we end up looking for these platforms wherever we can find them. And sports serves so as other platform, right? I remember when, I remember Dr. J was um, buying Coke manufacturing companies, or when Magic Johnson started putting theaters into, mm -hmm. in, so th there's, a, there's a platform for these folks, and that it seems like people from the mainstream um, society seem upset when folks don't forget their roots. Mm -hmm and they don't kind of like live in LA and chill, and they actually remember what things were like, or they, are they trying to give back, or they're trying to help some people up. And I think sports serves as this mechanism. I mean, you could try to harness it for 24-hour basketball to try to occupy people's time, or you can acknowledge that um, basketball and other types of sports are in every community, in every part of this country, and that is a mechanism for communication, aspiration, communion, up until, my 40s, I would like go to a new city and like and stop on a ball court and then find some new people, and that that those became like the central core of my peeps outside of work. Mm -hmm. And so I think that there's an, an essential aspect of sport that's just within the society. Mm -hmm. But the idea of the minute you have that platform to be able to use it to not just profiteer, but also to kind of like institute social change, I think that um, unless we demote sports, which I don't see happening anytime mm -hmm. soon, unless or unless the other the other pernicious change that we could get is more tightly written contracts that would be like, you say a word, mm -hmm. you're gone. Yeah. And, like, and, then, and then you're going to have to give up even more, right? And so I think um, these two different ways are, 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 are an interesting kind of like response to see how people are going to go. Right. But I think diffusion is definitely one of them. And that, because now with Copernic basically out um, officially, but still practicing or whatever, he can now do a bunch of other things, in a sense making him even more dangerous, because that will allow him to kind of step forward. And a bunch of other people, though, I think this is going to be some interesting choices with regards to um, other athletes, because they are trained in a particular way, they are cultivated in a particular way to look for certain types of things. This will be a hard one. This will be like rocking their, their core values or aspirations. But everyone that pays attention to these things, that is the majority of us, um, I think will take these signals to be like, oh, well, if, if this brother's talking about this too, then this, this clearly is sending a signal that now is the time we need to substantially address this particular problem. Now, whether or not we're going to address that is something different, right. but I think the pressure points will continue. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it makes complete sense that you have more and more individuals from more and more different types of sport at more and more levels mm -hmm. coming forward to do things. And this is actually going to be kind of an interesting point where, when the Missouri football team basically stepped forward and they were just like, I'm not going to do anything. I'm sure every athletic program in the United States that had a program or had a, that had a program was going to be on television was kind of like, okay, we need to insulate them. We can't allow people to get access to them. Um, but that's a good tension in many respects. And that kind of pressure, I think, is going to be extremely healthy for voicing opinions about topics that have largely been silenced. And if sport is not a safe domain, all the better, because then we'll move closer to social change. Right. right. And, you know, you talk about some of the, uh, the challenges and 
um, the implications of speaking out. You talk about the need for athletes to use their platform. But we know anytime you contest or resist the power structure and the norms and the social political status quo in society, there's some risk involved. Talk about some of the consequences um, that you see. You, you mentioned you know, Kaepernick. He's not, he's not playing right now. So that's one of the consequences. But you know, it could be limited to social movements in sport or social movements in general. What are the consequences that you think really have made people pause in, in being involved as an activist? Yeah. I mean, so I mean, being blackballed or um, blacklisted, um, not being able, I mean, we have, uh, you kind of get those, you know those, um, when you're watching the Olympics and they give you the, they show you the Olympic athlete and then they go back to their hometown and then, and then you get the sense of, oh, they've been doing this since they were eight years right. old. I mean, so basically if, um, if you, they're in a sense revealing the trajectory that it took this person to get to this level, but they will be sacrificing all of that time. And so by taking the steps that they are, it's kind of like you're, you're missing out on that. And then the whole conversation about, okay, well, all the endorsements, all of the being able to help your family. I mean, so there's very pers there's like huge personal risk. There's huge um, elements of, um, I mean, people can go to jail depending upon what strategies they're engaging in. Um, they could end up killed actually for, um, for their activities. And so um, I know Jackie Robinson wrote quite frequently about being threatened all the time. And so um, I was always waiting to hear about like whether or not the deacons of self-defense or something came to his side to kind of like roll with the team, but I never, I never, I never heard about that. Probably not. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but I think um, everything from financial ruin to, to death to um, defamation, no one, no, no one willing to hire you for anything ever again. I mean, I think it runs the gamut with regards to how lives could be devastated. And the interesting thing is um, that there'll be amazing resonance off the punishment, right? So everyone knows that Copernic is not in the league mm -hmm. and is like persona non grata. And so that sends a signal. It's like, if you wish to have a voice, we're not going to tell you you can't have a voice, but if you wish to have a voice, you won't have a job. And you will have spent all this time trying to get to this particular point to be jobless and to have no apparent future, because there's clearly, the, clearly the brother will have a future. What, what he ends up doing will be remarkable, but in a sense, I think um, by taking it outside of sport and now being more of a public figure, I think he has even more resonance and more power. And so that'll send a different, that will not send the signal that I think the people that punished him wanted to send, but I think even more people would be like, you know, we can have a bigger impact than we thought. Um, I remember, because I was in Houston for a while, and then like Warren Moon had the Crescent Moon Foundation where basically he was trying to do something. But if you think about it, almost every big athlete now in order to be big has some cause. Exactly. And so that shifted as well. I'm not exactly sure what the date on that shift was, but once that shifted, I'm just like, oh, okay, so everyone needs a cause to be, to, you, need a shoe, you need a pair of shoes and at, with your picture on it, and you need a cause to hit that really big level. And then, then you started to see like the causes compete with one another. It's like, oh, Magic got some theaters. Okay, I'm going to have like video game park. Right, I'm right. Like, and so my thing was there's a, there's a positive uh, externality from this where it was just like, oh, you know what, we, a bunch of people get some parks that they didn't have before. And so I'm not upset with regards to that. The elevation of sport over education or something like that, that's, that's somewhat problematic, but that's a, that's a deeper thing within the, within the, within the population. Mm -hmm. um, but I like the, um, I like the embracement of um, what I liked on seeing the Caperni thing, right? It's staged, right? But I think that there is an embracing of this brother for his stance for acknowledging um, what the problem was and doing the sacrifice that he did and is being embraced by people. Now, whether or not that pays rent is, uh, is a separate point, and that would be part of the signal. Um, but I think, um, I, think the, I think both the negatives of taking these activities um, are more frequently highlighted than the positives, which I think will be highlighted. Mm -hmm. I think that there is something to be said about the shift. And even in his silence, I get the sense of, his greater awareness and politicization. And I know people jump immediately to I'm talking about Ali or Jackie Robinson, but I'm just kind of like, I'm like, I'm not quite calling the brother Ali yet. Mm -hmm. He had a little bit different level of um, political engagement, but there was also organizations that right. the nation and so forth that were, that were around him at the time that were trying to kind of cultivate him and Malcolm, right? So it's like a very different kind of context mm -hmm. in many respects, but I think the parallels are clear. I think how many, you know, how many, how many little kids play football or want to play football? I mean, like, so there's a bunch of signals that I think um, could resonate. And if people are able to align this physicality with some sense of consciousness about politics and justice, all the better. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I'm going to you know, wrap it up. You, you've been so insightful. Um, 
I want to give you a chance. It sounds like, if I heard you correctly, you think this social movement, this is a good thing, the way athletes are using sport to evoke change, social change. Would you have a call to action relative to embracing this social movement or any concluding thoughts about this whole notion of free speech in sports? Okay, so here's where I get in trouble, right? Um, so um, so I, was, I was very much taken by um, the Missouri football team. Um, I think being, being an educator in college, I've had this attitude for a while. Once I became aware of how the athletes were treated and thinking about the relationship or lack thereof of the connection between the university and the communities around it, um, I basically had an opinion. I love college. I love sports. I don't love college sports. The Missouri action brought me back to love college sports. Um, actually, Notre Dame helped bring me there as well. Um, Notre Dame has this thing, um, it's called, um, at, at halftime, they have this, um, what, is, what, do you, what is worth fighting for? Mm -hmm. And effectively, they highlighted a faculty member's work. This is, this is during the mid part of the game, halftime show, right in the middle of it, they're highlighting some research concerned with social change. Uh -huh. And I'm sitting there going, they're back together. And mm -hmm. so, so between those two, I've come to kind of like reaffirm, but if every sports team in the United States concern themselves with some social justice issue and they were willing to speak up on behalf of that particular issue whenever they had a platform, then we have change. Um, there's a, it's just this bracketing of we, we want sports for certain types of things. We want certain people that are only in this particular venue. And if you want to profiteer or seek seek financial benefit for your individual effort, that's fine, but leave these collective wrongs alone. Once that's broken down, and once all of these people realize that the minute they are out on that field or stage, that it's their field or their stage, and that the rest of their life comes with them, then we're all better off. Right. And so I, I wish to invoke this sense that every athlete needs to feel that they are as much activist as they are, athlete as they are a student. Right. Very good. You know, I, I wanted, th there's lots of ways of looking at this notion of free speech in sport. And there are many people who think sport is no place for political expressions. And you have clearly articulated that it is political, very much political. And you've off offered us so much valuable insight. Sincerely appreciate it. So um, again, Dr. Uh, Christian Davenport offered us some valuable in information on our politicization, if that's a word, if I'm saying that correctly, of free speech in sport. Thank you very much. Thank you.